So uh, yeah, welcome to extending a high performance data streaming system with WebAssembly. We're going to talk about um, both what is this system and why would you want to uh, extend this system with WebAssembly. Um, my name is Tyler Rockwood. I'm the tech lead for data transformations at Red Panda Data. Um, I'm a happy, and, and we'll talk and dig into what are data transformations and yeah, what is Red Panda. Um, so agenda, we're going to talk through three main points. We're going to talk about just a quick introduction to what Red Panda is, um, what data transformations and streaming is, and um, we'll work through a case study. And then last one is just what are the challenges of embedding a WebAssembly runtime within Red Panda? We have a high-performance computing environment, so we impose a lot of restrictions on ourselves, which I'll get into later, um, and that poses some challenges. So we'll work through some of those. Um, so first... Introduction, what is Red Panda in 60 seconds? Uh, Red Panda is a high-performance data streaming engine. We speak the Apache Kafka API. Um, so if you're not familiar with Kafka, that's okay. It's, um, think of the, the simplest primitive I can give you is it's a, it's a log, and you can produce to the end of that log, and then you can consume from some offset in that log to the end. So it uses a message broker um, to power a lot of applications, sort of decouple your producing events um, from your consuming events. Um, so these go into partitions, which is sort of the smallest level of abstraction, and then you can kind of group those into topics. Um, and you get ordering for each of these logs within a single partition. So you can think of a, a partition is essentially a, a log. It's a distributed log as well. Um, we generally have lots of logs uh, of these partitions per cluster. And then each of these partitions is a raft group. So we use the raft consensus protocol to ensure that your data is replicated safely. You don't have any data loss, things like that. Um, and then one of our major selling points, besides we're very high performance, um, low TCO, we also are simple to manage and, de and deploy. So uh, it's not a bunch of different services you have to set up. We're one single binary that you can deploy and that runs on any Linux system. Okay, so that's a real quick overview into Red Panda. I'll talk more about some of the interesting bits of Red Panda and its architecture in a little bit. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about what is data transformation in this streaming pipeline when you're producing and consuming events in these architectures. So this is a quick example of an e-commerce sort of application use case using um, any sort of Kafka-compatible API like Red Panda or Apache Kafka itself. Um, this use case is sort of, we have transactions that are happening in this uh, business. Those get pushed into a, uh, a log a topic called transactions, uh, which has the information about how much, in, uh, how much the transaction was, who made the transaction, credit card information, all these sorts of things, and then that gets consumed downstream by a separate application doing fraud detection. So this is a use case that we see for data streaming in e-commerce um, applications. So let's say you, your business then wants to go, okay, we want to do like restocking of our inventory very quickly. So we want to consume this real-time events of transactions and as things are being bought, we want to make sure we replenish the, uh, our stock. So. If you want to add this, then you say, oh, simple, I just add in another component that will sort of do this processing and consume from this log. However, there's one problem with this, is that um, there's a bunch of, like I said, credit card information and thing in, information in there that the fraud detection system needs, but you don't want to expose to sort of the supply chain side of the wheelhouse part of your company. Um, so a way that you can do this is, well, let's just write this to a separate log um, that doesn't have any personal identifiable information or any sort of... Um, uh, sensitive information in it. So, uh, and then we'll just have the restocking, uh, com like subsystem kind of uh, stream in data and consume data from that. So, how would you do this in a sort of today in a normal sort of thing? Is you'd stand up a whole separate uh, distributed application to sort of read in this transaction original data, do these really simple transform, strip out a few fields, and write it back in. You can use Apache Flink. There's lots of different sort of solutions to do these sorts of really simple stateless transformations. But now you're spinning up an entire new infrastructure and cluster just to apply these really simple, small uh, transformations on your data. And now you're maybe seeing where WebAssembly can come in. So with Red Panda, we have the ability to, um, within the broker itself, as these events are being streamed into one of the logs, we can read information that are on these logs, process it through whatever your custom business logic is in your WebAssembly module, and then output it to a separate uh, topic for you to then consume. So this allows you to sort of build really nice pluggable, extend your broker to satisfy your business requirements without needing to um, set up a whole bunch of extra infrastructure, figure out how to monitor it, figure out the costing and sizing and all those sorts of things. These can all be built into the broker. We'll have all the metrics and logs and things for you built in. Um, so this is sort of at a high level what happens. You have one log, and each of these in the log is a series of records. And we'll take each of these records, push it through your WASM transformation, and we'll get a record back out, and then we'll write these into the output uh, log. 
uh, on a different partition. And these can exist in sorts of all sorts of different ways. So here's a really high level, I'm gonna kind of fly through this, uh, overview of Red Panda's architecture. So we have the Kafka API compatibility layer, and that goes down into the RAF subsystem, which then handles replication of this to multiple nodes and getting all the uh, appropriate consensus, and then also F-syncing it to disk so it's safe. So that, that happens today. What we've done is added WebAssembly on top of the RAF subsystem to then pull in data as it's committed to the original input topic. We process it per each log, and then we'll write it to wherever it needs to go. So let's say in, in the example I have, you have your transactions and your output of like clean transaction data, right? So as transactions, events, records are written to the input topic, we'll, for each of those different partitions, we'll have a VM deployed on that core, um, and we will pull in, pull those logs and push it through the WebAssembly runtime. So um, Red Panda is a thread per core architecture. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. So um, we run one of these on every core at which these are needed. And um, we run these transformations on the input partitions leader, in, it's raft leader. So the raft leader is the one that knows whether or not something's committed, it's been successfully act, and then that's when you can then go ahead and process it. So we get the same sort of safety and durability guarantees that we already provide. Um, so why use WebAssembly for this task? I mean, so uh, obviously the appeal to use any language that you want um, for our use case of a high performance broker is the very strict runtime limits you can impose. So I'm gonna detail here at the end some of the challenges around these runtime limits and the constraints that we have programming within Red Panda that we're able to impose on the WebAssembly um, virtual machine so that you don't have any sort of latency hiccups or any sort of performance issues as you're running and deploying this sort of and running these user code. And then also, um, the WASI standard is really great. It gives us this sort of like sandbox POSIX environment. So for us, we use this. You can deploy configure, configuration via environment variables. So you can sort of, you know, configure it. You know, in this environment, I have these different policies or whatever it wants to be. Whatever you want your application to do, you can embed these as sort of like runtime injectable uh, configuration. Uh, we also use standard out uh, and standard air as a logging mechanism, so you can just print printlin or however that is in your language, and you can um, consume those via the normal logging frameworks. So now, how do I actually use this? So we have built, we have this tool called RPK, which is our sort of one-stop shop for interacting with Red Panda, and built into RPK, we've provided the developer experience. Developer experience. So and a way to initialize projects of, um, you know, you can pick, specify what language you want, you can give it a name, description, some other metadata, um, and then from there you get a single file. So this is example is using the TinyGo compiler to build um, a transform. You can edit your transform uh, to do whatever business logic you want. We'll walk through sort of what that looks like very briefly, and then I will, um, and then you can build it. We, for some more obscure sort of Tool, uh, tool chains and, and compilers will embed a sort of tool chain for you and download it and manage it so you don't have to, but then for more common things, we'll just use the system compilers that you have installed. Um, and then lastly, you can sort of, you can deploy these um, to any sort of input and output topics and we'll manage all the uh, machinery around replicating this safely, persisting it, making sure it runs in all the right places within the broker and uh, within the entire cluster. Um, so here's a very short snippet of code that is a, a sort of a, a hello world, so to speak, in, in streaming transformations. So um, I'm going to walk through this one for one. If you're not familiar with Go, it should, hopefully it's fine. Um, so I just want to talk about the signature to start. So this is sort of the programming model that we expose to people, is that um, you get a write event, which this means, so an event has happened post-write. We've successfully confirmed it's f-sync to disk. Now you can take that event, it contains a record, and you can do some sort of transform, and you're going to return a set of records or an error, um, which is sort of like a generic Go pattern. Um, but these set of records, the nice thing about it is I can do filters, so I can do one record to zero. So say I want to just fork a subset of my data stream to another topic for whatever reason, um, I can do that. I can also flatten uh, records as well. Let's say I get in from some third party, like an, ar an array of, of JSON events or something, and I want to flatten that so it's one record per output. Um, I can do things like that as well. Um, or also just the standard sort of one-to-one -one transformations of I want to take JSON data in, spit it out to Apache Avro, Protobuf, whatever it is. Or if you want to do like what we talked about in this case study of just stripping out PII or things like that. So you can do any sorts of uh, simple transformations. So this is an example of taking, that, uh, taking some XML input data. I don't, I don't like working with XML. I've written lots of Java and yeah, uh, much more uh, friendly to work with JSON these days. So uh, it takes a small Go program that will take the input XML data, it'll unmarshal it, um, into some sort of structure, um, and then we'll re 
serialize it into JSON, and then we'll output that, copying the key over. A record in Kafka in parlance is a, a, basically a key and value pair. Um, there's also some headers if you for additional information, but for the most part, there's just key value pair. Um, and that's sort of a very simple transformation that you can write in just a few lines of code. You can deploy this to your Red Panda cluster, and we'll scale this up as many partitions that you have and run it at very high, high scale and a high throughput um, and all the sort of tenants that we hold to at Red Panda. Um, okay, so that's sort of my sort of whirlwind talk through um, sort of what is data transformations, how it's architected within Red Panda. Now I want to dive into some of the more technical challenges of embedding a WebAssembly runtime into Red Panda itself. So first, uh, we're going to talk about a little bit what makes Red Panda efficient and fast. You know, I mentioned it's a fast piece of software. We hold our hand, uh, we hold hang our hat on um, really efficient, um, low resource utilization workloads um, for, at very high throughput and scale. Um, so one th the ways that we do this is um, we're a thread per core architecture, which is something high, the high performance computing environment is very familiar with. Um, but we spin up one thread per each logical core on your system, and then we use all asynchronous. Um, system calls. So whether that's talking to network or disk, um, nothing ever blocks. And then what we do is we run an, a reactor loop, uh, similar to like an event loop in Node.js, if you're familiar with that programming paradigm, um, to each loop to sort of process tasks as they happen. Um, and then we share nothing in terms of memory between each of these cores. You can kind of think of it, each of these cores as its own logical little computer. And we uh, take the whole, we allocate all the system memory up front, um, and then we divide it up onto each core in sort of a, a NUMA friendly sort of pattern in dist distribution. Um, and then we communicate between cores. Um, cores need to talk, for example, where network requests may come on in a core one, but core two needs to then um, like actually process the write, for example, um, using a bunch of single producer, single consumer message queues. It sort of makes a little mesh for them to talk to uh, between. And we use a, a framework called CSTAR for this, which is a really great high power performance. It's written in C++20, modern C++, which has a lot of great um, advantages I'll talk a little bit more about. But see, we love CSTAR. It's, it, it's what empowers us and is the framework of which we've built this high performance message broker upon. Um, so there's a little bit of architecture overview and some of the constraints that we, uh, I wanted to go through some of the constraints by this programming model that we sort of have to apply. So um, we have these sort of reactor loops that I talked about. So, um, and we use async IO. So um, we use cooperative multitasking to sort of um, manage all the different tasks that are happening to a single local core. Since there's only one thread processing um, a, a logical subset of the system. And um, what this means is that each task is responsible for giving up um, its share of the CPU um, when after some period of time. So if failure to do this is known as a, what we call a reactor stall. So the important thing about these reactor stalls is that they impact your P99 latencies, which we care a lot about keeping those very low. So for example, we only have one core processing, let's say 10 network uh, operations. If one of those operations takes you know, 50 milliseconds, for example, to do some work, then that means there's 50 milliseconds where those other network connections, nothing can happen. You can't process I.O., you can't do work for them. So what we need to do is any long computations, we need to break up to prevent blocking um, I.O. from happening on other workloads and make sure there's shared scheduling and fairness. Um, so we heavily use stackless, stackless coroutines to do this. And just for a sort of a mental model, for us, a long task, our budget that we use to execute a single task is about half a millisecond. So 500 microseconds is our policy for about how long a task should go before it needs to yield control. So we have lots of different ways of doing this. Like I said, stack, uh, stackless coroutines in C++20 is a really uh, nice programming model for us to do this. So here's a simple example of taking some data off an input stream, let's say from network or even disk, and just reading some data. Now. In a normal sort of system, you may use blocking I.O. and you'll just have a while loop that kind of runs and it sort of eats that thread while it's processing and reading data, right? So we don't, we don't use this paradigm. So what we use is coroutines. You can kind of see this co-await keyword here. Is a, it, it uh, inserts a, a scheduling point and tells the scheduler for CSTAR of don't resume this code until um, this event has finished. So if you're familiar with Node.js programming, this is sort of the async await sort of paradigm. Or if you're familiar with Rust even, it's sort of the same async await sort of model. Although Tokyo for Rust uses a work stealing um, sort of scheduler, which we don't, we don't use. Um, everything is locked onto a single core. So it's of utmost importance that we yield CPU control because we don't allow any sharing. Um, so that's sort of the, the paradigm here. So now, how do we prevent, as we're embedding a, a WebAssembly um, runtime, how do we prevent that runtime from stalling and hogging up the CPU for a second? So let's say you have a, a transform that's relatively expensive and takes, you know, 
let's say 50 milliseconds of compute. I, I think the average developer probably doesn't blink or at, at that long of a computation, but for us within Red Panda, we, we can't allow that, because um, that means there's a ton of requests now that just encountered a 50 millisecond latency spike. So how we do this within Red Panda is we use uh, stack full coroutines, um, stack switching. So we run all of Red Panda in the sort of stackless coroutines within Red Panda as normal, the event loop runs. Um, and then within the WebAssembly VM, we allocate a separate stack to execute that on. So that allows us to swap back and forth between executing the VM and ex executing our actual code itself. Um, and and these, the, the advantage of using um, these sort of stackful coroutines over a actual like spinning up a separate thread for the WebAssembly VM is these context switches are very cheap. Most of the premise of Red Panda allows us to do kernel bypass for very fast and efficient processing. So these, uh, these kernel switches or these, excuse me, these stack switches only take about nine, uh, nine CPU cycles on sort of modern machines. Um, so we sort of allocate these separate st stacks, and then the nice thing is a lot of these uh, very advanced um, WebAssembly VMs, such as Wasm Time, allow you to inject into the compiled code uh, sort of instruction counts. So you can say after X number of instructions, yield control um, VM and switch back to my stack so that I can run. We've also been able to do this sort of same model in other frameworks that don't support um, the native stack switching as well. You can do stack switching sort of in user land, so to speak, as well. Um, so that's sort of, that, that, that's how we prevent these stalls is what we do is we, we'll run our WebAssembly VM for, you know, our task budget and then we'll, we'll swap it out for running the actual like client IO and other sort of important information, important tasks the broker needs to do. Um, this also allows us to do sort of, I talked about this sort of uh, message passing model. This allows us to use that within the VM as well. So there are certain host calls that we expose within Red Panda in our SDKs to be able to read data on uh, different cores. So for example, some of our data is sharded to every core for memory reasons, because um, we don't have a ton of memory on a single core. So it may be that there's a transform running on core one that needs to go grab data from core two. So what we do with the stack switching is we're able to uh, switch out the stack and run other sorts of computation while um, there's a, a uh, message in flight to talk to core two, get the information it needs, and bring it back to core one so that we can then copy it into the uh, WebAssembly VM. Uh, next, I want to talk, so that was sort of an overview of memory and some of the things there. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, or excuse me, that was talking about CPU. I want to now talk to memory, talk about memory and some of the constraints here. So I talked about each core has its own equal share of memory on startup. There's a buddy allocator we run on each shard. Um, so there's no synchronization of memory between shards at all. Um, we also don't use a page cache for any of our I.O. IO. It's a sort of a separate detail, um, but we do all of our caching within the application. We don't rely on the kernel to do that for us. We use DMA writes and things like that um, so that, you know, we can get the optimal caching strategy for our application, not the generic one for the kernel. Um, one of these things about this model is since we allocate everything and we have these fixed pools up front is the allocation can fail of memory uh, during the execution of our program. Normally, if you malloc stuff in a normal C program, the, the OS will sort of hand out virtual memory until it sort of runs out um, or it'll swap or things like that. So uh, we don't allow that mostly because those are end up being like sort of soft, fa soft failure scenarios in your applications where um, you're, you're swapping memory and performance starts to tank. So using this sort of constrained memory model allows us to make sure we're, we're um, going very fast. So we need to force WebAssembly to also respect these constraints. Um, WebAssembly defines a linear memory um, as sort of one large contiguous ad address space. And this is sort of for per performance reasons um, and things like that. So, um, and there's also another structure called a table that stores things like references to functions and things like that. So both of these are, uh, are potentially large contiguous chunks of memory that as Red Panda runs, um, memory fragmentation builds up, we may not be able to allocate those large structures as we boot up VMs. So you don't want to deploy um, a WebAssembly function and then all of a sudden not have enough memory to do that. And that either booms your uh, Red Panda broker or something else. So what we do is, um, for linear memory, these are large pools of memory. We have a budget, we, we sort of have a budget of like, under this fixed amount of memory, we can always say we can allocate um, a contiguous chunk of. Anything over that, um, our strategy is to reserve a pool of memory up front. So sort of the computing model, since you're now sharing the computing model that we use in Red Panda when you're embedding your own functions, is you have to carve out how much memory you want that we can allocate for the VM. So on startup, each core sort of reserves some, you know, few megabytes, maybe multiple megabytes if you're running something like JavaScript um, on each core so that we can then use that memory that's pre-allocated um, and isn't subject to fragmentation for the VMs itself. And then for the tables themselves, those are usually fairly small, so we just limit that to the, our maximum allocation size that we try to fit everything into. 
Um, awesome, so takeaways. So Red Panda can help you transform your data directly in the broker, message broker, in a high performance way. Um, you can you know, use your, whatever language that compiles to WebAssembly to use, to use this sort of simple programming model that we've, ex, we've uh, ex, exposed. WebAssembly itself is friendly to thread per core architectures and sort of these more advanced and better requirements. And then WebAssembly runtimes itself have, yeah, support these sort of advanced use cases of thread per core or limited memory usage. Um, thanks for joining. I'd love to take some questions. We're going to be in the main section at booth F13 if you want to talk more. Um, there's a link for feedback. I would love to hear your feedback on the session, um, the talk, the content. Um, and also, if you're interested, we are hiring as well on my team and other teams um, within Red Panda. So if this sounds like an exciting sort of space for you, um, I'm happy to talk, talk more. Um, thank you. Any questions? Got a question for you. You know, I think one of the things that really uh, you guys have crushed is uh, making sure that you're always zero copy, you know, and uh, just really fast transformations of data. Um, what's the performance impact um, for the inside, uh, you know, inline WebAssembly transformations? Um, right now, you're, you're pulling the data into WebAssembly processing and then coming back out. Um, soon, you'll be able to keep it outside, I believe. Um, uh, to the guest house barrier, but what, what performance are you seeing? Yeah, so right now you have to copy every record into the VM and record out. We do this on a per record basis for like lower memory overhead. Um, but we've been able to push like a, a few megabytes in our sort of con, uh, constrained uh, environment per core per second um, with WebAssembly. And I, I've done some benchmarking where we've been able to get over a gigabyte a second on larger, uh, a few like medium sized clusters. Um, pushing through the WebAssembly VM. So that's sort of the, uh, I think, power of sort of just-in-time compilation. And um, there's a lot of other things I didn't talk about, like some, there's a lot of tricks that WebAssembly runtimes use to prevent um, bounds checking for all the memory accesses by using some virtual memory tricks. We can't necessarily do that in our environment. So we have to enable a lot of the extra security steps that um, advanced VMs have removed in, in more generic contexts, um, just so it works for our embedding. But we're still able to push the performance envelope quite well. Great. Other questions? Here in the back, Sean. Thanks. All right, so I have a bit of a technical question. Um, one of the performance bottlenecks in really highly parallel systems with WebAssembly in the runtime side can be in how you use the WebAssembly store and how you use the linker, for example, in Wasm time. So there are cases where, are there cases where you're like spinning up a new linker for every transformation that's being applied or, you know, like, like what does the parallelism model actually look like in the, in the runtime context? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great question. We've done numerous iterations of our ABI to sort of like figure out what the right model is. So we actually only compose, we generate a single instance of, uh, a, of a module within Wasm time on uh, a per, so one per process. So we do one and then what we do is every core then gets a, a not a copy of that, but re, uh, a, a reference to that module. And then at runtime, we look up the host data through the embedding to um, make sure we're grabbing information for that instance of the VM um, in particular, if that makes sense. So there's a way to like within a store embed very specific information. And, and one of the pieces of information we embed is what the underlying, what we call engine is that has the actual records being pushed through for metadata and things. So we only have to compile a module once for an entire broker based on our ABI and how we sort of structured um, our embedding. <laughs> Okay, that makes sense. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah of course. There's a question back here. Uh, hi, I've, a great talk. I found your use case kind of fascinating, being able to like strip out, you know, privacy sensitive data and offer sort of like two copies of the record in different logs. Um, I'm wondering, first off, is that transactional? Um, and if so, how does that handle the, the case where like the WebAssembly runtime, you know, the code in there fails and like throws an exception or doesn't deliver a record? And what does that mean? Does the, the, like the raft leader reject the record or do you get like, how does that work? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So um, first of all is um, we, we support at, at most, or sorry, at least once delivery semantics. We don't have exactly once yet. We want to get there. There's some ideas we have to get there, but they're larger system changes. So uh, it's fairly 
common in Kafka to have at least at least once processing. So that's sort of the model we've rolled out at, at first. Um, with that model, and, and the other thing is you mentioned with the raft leader, um, these are all an asynchronous sort of process. So we don't ever block incoming writes and in throughput from clients directly to process these. There are ideas that we want to do this later on um, to be able to validate payloads and things like that. But for now, this is sort of, you can think of it as like a background process running in, within the broker that sort of consumes this data and then writes it back out. Um, that's sort of the processing model, which allows us to do for failure modes, um, you know, we can just sort of restart and, and reapply for at least once and sort of uh, periodically commit data. Um, but we, we would like to do more things like, you know, if your code's just failing, throwing an exception, whatever it is, then the uh, WebAssembly runtime's ooming. What we can do is um, like create a dead letter queue or something for that so you can resume processing. For now, we sort of halt processing as sort of a safe default, but we would like to do more dead letter queue, which is more like, I think, standard uh, for stream processing applications. Great question. Thank you. All right, please join me in thanking Tyler.